good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the Europe Center. My name is Christophe Flambe, and a seminar series we have uh, Tariq Abu Shadi from the University of Zurich. And uh, he's an expert in um, the study of um, radical right parties, but also um, of parties on the left that are more on uh, the extremes and uh, other uh, important issues in European politics. Today, he's going to talk about the radical right and how its support is affected by uh, economic conditions uh, within the household. Tariq is going to talk for about uh, 25 minutes, I believe. You can, uh, in the meantime, if you have questions, you can uh, enter them in the chat box. And then um, Anna, uh, the director of our uh, center, uh, will um, we'll, uh, go through the questions and lead the Q&A after uh, Tariq is done with the talk. So welcome, Tariq. Uh, you have the floor. Okay, let me share my slides first. Great. Well, thanks. Th thanks so much for, for having me. And um, thanks, everyone, for uh, taking the time. I'm uh, well aware that other important uh, Things are happening uh, at the at the moment and around this talk, and I also just said this as kind of it's not really a I'll take your mind off for an hour uh, topic, but actually quite relevant. And if I may start with this anecdote, and when um, four years ago, a couple of days after the presidential election, um, and Trump uh, Trump got elected, um, many many friends and colleagues from the U.S. actually sent me emails and asked about teaching material and articles and so on that. Um, that deal with the radical right and deal with uh, with populism, and so it was uh, very much then in in a way this, the the question of does studying Europe and does um, studying the radical right help us to better understand U.S. politics and Trump? And I guess at the time, um, I would have been hesitant to call the Republican Party, especially um, a radical right party, and especially uh, tr maybe Trump as a single politician. Yes but I would have been hesitant for the Republican Party. I think after four years of Trump as a president and how the, the Republican Party has changed with him, I would clearly now from the comparative, uh, comparativist perspective, uh, probably call the, uh, the Republican Party a radical right party now. And so I guess um, this is uh, studying these parties from a European perspective has a lot of uh, relevance for uh, also for, for what's happening in the US at the moment. Getting coming to the to the, to the actual paper, um, I should say this is co-authored work with uh, Thomas Kuhre, who's a postdoc at the University of Zurich too. Um, and to motivate this paper a bit, and I'm, I'm sure everyone's uh, quite familiar with this, uh, the what you see here is the vote share of populist radical right parties in 17 West European countries since 1990. Um, and what you can see is, of course, that the radical right has strongly increased their vote share. Uh, they have become more successful. They are also uh, have made it into to several governments during this period. So they've really become an established actor in uh, Western European countries. A little bit, if you had a political science research question on the radical right in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, very often the motivation would have been something like, um, why is the radical right successful in one country, but not in another country? And this question has disappeared in a way because the radical right now is a successful established party um, in basically all Western European uh, countries. So what we've also seen, and I think this is something also that the talk speaks to a little bit, is a, um, is a return of many demand side studies and studying the demand side of, of radical right support. So why individuals, um, in different circumstances support radical right parties. Um, what I want to do in this paper, so I'll just give you a brief uh, summary of the paper in a nutshell. And um, so what we want to do in this paper is we want to know how the distribution of unemployment risks within households affects voting for the radical right. And what we find is that A, we find a strong direct effect of unemployment risk. So who's at higher unemployment risk is more likely to vote for the radical right. However, this effect is moderated by a partner's unemployment risk. Um, and, but this goes in a specific way. So it's not what we find, it's not the case that uh, partners with a low unemployment risk uh, 
can provide a safety net and a remedy and reduce the risk of another partner. But what we find is that um, basically one partner's high risk is a sufficient condition to increase the likelihood of radical right voting in a household. Uh, yeah, in a household. Um, to start out the, with, the, with the literature that we build on, over the past years, there have been um, quite a couple of advances in studying the economic determinants of radical right support. So for a long time, this literature really, there was one sentence that came up in, in, in many, many papers and, and books or something like, it's not the economy stupid. So this literature for a long time focused really on so-called cultural factors. Um, many empirical studies had shown that for example, um, unemployment status or low income aren't good predictors of voting for the radical right. So people had turned away um, from these economic factors. But in these recent advances, really, there's been a new focus on studying economic determinants in a different way. Um, and what this literature has done, it's moved away from um, economic hardship as a predictor alone. So questions of being unemployed, um, having low income, these types of direct economic hardship, and has focused more on relative economic positions. So your economic position compared to other people, but also an intertemporal perspective on your economic position. So how did you do 20, 30 years ago compared to now? Um, also, how do you think, what do you project how you'll do in the future? So this question of uh, economic threats and also um, economic risks. And this is now uh, at, the, at the center of this, uh, uh, of this literature that we are also trying to build on. The second um, factor that's emphasized in this literature is the importance of context conditions and reference points. So the idea that economic risk isn't necessarily individualized, but it's always um, perceived as part of a group. And again, with your group, also in relation to other groups. And so what this also means is that potentially these groups can somehow mediate economic pressure. It's not necessarily perceived as an individual, um, but it is perceived as a member of a group. And so we, what we try to do in the study is we try to integrate these different perspectives and then also um, empirically investigate them. One main question then of course is why, how should economic risk affect voting for um, the radical right? And this is interestingly, um, actually Lipset in his famous essay on the far right in America in 1955 already um, argues that economic risk much more then economic hardship should be the interesting factor uh, when we study support for the far right in contrast to what he then calls more mainstream politics. Um, then now this, uh, that, that has disappeared a bit as a factor and in this newer studies, there are two mechanisms that are usually brought forward for why um, economic risk should uh, potentially affect voting for the radical right. And, and we we're trying to separate in them into two different types of um, of mechanisms. The first, in, in, in that voting for the radical right is more or less seen as a policy insurance. So people who are at risk want to protect themselves from factors that are very often associated with globalization. So on the one hand, this is immigration, but also trade. And then voting for the radical right and their policies, so very restrictive policies on immigration, but also economic protectionism, these factors um, help people at risk to protect themselves. Um, they want to protect themselves from these factors by the policies of the radical right. The second mechanism um, works in a different way. Here, economic risks activate something like societal pessimism. So there's an activation of a perception of status threat, of this gap in recognition. People start um, becoming nostalgic for a period that maybe never existed and have just this idea of society moving away from them. And that general pessimism then triggers voting for the radical right more through a protest mechanism. Empirically then this is still an ongoing debate that we want to uh, contribute to. So the fact that the question just does economic risk, is economic risk a better predictor than economic hardship, does economic risk really affect voting for the radical right? So this is our first contribution. We see we want to directly test this question of the relationship of economic risk and radical right support. 
However, where we, what our main argument here is really is that economic pressures um, should not be regarded for individuals alone, but they are moderated by household constellations. And here we borrow from um, very prominent theories from economics and sociology that um, model household interactions and try to uh, make predictions about how members of households interact, but then al also how they form preferences and how they behave uh, then based on the resource distributions within their households. Uh, the most famous one of these is, uh, comes from, from Gary Becker and it's, it's a, a quite simple idea of resource pooling within the household. So um, the idea here is that members of a household try to maximize their utility based on a common budget. So they pool their resources and based on this form preferences and behave in a certain way. In our study, we of course don't want to uh, study resources, but we are focused on risks. So we're trying to translate this in the world of in, into the world of risks. We would argue then here that again, household members should pool their risks, and someone at a lower risk can provide a safety net, a remedy for the high risk um, of the other partner. But similar to the resources, people in a household average their risks out and then act uh, accordingly and form their preferences accordingly and potentially vote for the radical right in this risk pooling scenario. There's a second um, of these uh, theories that we borrow and that is um, that's built on the work of Ericsson and can be labeled a dominance theory of, uh, of households. Here, um, preferences aren't pooled um, or, or resources aren't pooled, but preferences are aligned according to a dominant position in the household. In the work of Ericsson, this was, of course, strongly the idea of this male breadwinner in the household that then um, is um, the main focal point of how these preferences are formed and how people in, that, in, in the household behave. Um, we're, of course, A, looking at a, at a different time and different household constellations, but also we are looking at risks. So again, here we would argue um, that uh, from this logic and also building on theories of, for example, risk aversion, the focal point in a household should be the person with the higher risk and the higher risk person um, dominates and determines how members of the household then act and form their preferences. We have summarized these uh, arguments then in this stylized uh, way of how household risks and voting for the radical right um, should interact. Um, so you have in all these four um, graphs, you have voting for the radical right on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you have an increasing own risk, right? So this is an individual. And on the x-axis, um, your own risk, uh, economic risk increases. And then you have different constellations of how this interacts with a partner risk. And we show here two stylized ones, one where um, a partner has a high risk and or a partner has a low risk. Uh, the top row really, this is just for, for a complete overview here, there's not really much interaction going on in the household, so they're either completely in independent or just additive. In the, in the lower row, this is where we see those two theories that I just talked about represented. Um, so the first one on the, on the left, this would be an idea of resource pooling where um, risks average out. And then you can see that if um, your own, uh, if your partner is at lower risk, uh, then your, the relationship um, between your own risk increasing and an increase in uh, the likelihood of voting for the radical right is kind of buffered. The line is less steep. If you're at high risk and your risk increases, then also the line goes up more strongly um, and your, your likelihood of voting for the radical right increases more. In the, in, the, in the lower right corner, then you see the dominance mechanism and that would, would show a very different picture here. Um, your partner does not, is not able to provide any type of remedy. So you're, if, even if your partner is at low risk, you see this increase. But also importantly, when you yourself are at low risk and your partner has a high risk, your probability also strongly increases to vote for the radical right because the focus is on the person with the higher risk in the household. So this is the idea to these different types of interaction that we then want to study empirically. And this is a stylized picture of them. 
Um, I'll also show you later in the empirical results, we try to really map them onto this picture in the, in, in the, in the empirical results so that we can see which one of these is, um, uh, is, is, is more, we can find more in the empirical reality. Of course, they're stylized ideal types. Um, so the, the, the reality is, of course, some, somewhere in between them. Um, we then empirically test these expectations um, using data from the European Social Survey, which allows us to do a couple of things uh, that are relevant for, um, for studying this. First of all, the great thing about the European Social Survey is that it gives us a respondent's occupation and their partner's occupation. And based on this, we can then um, measure these household interactions and economic risk within the household for both partners. Um, as a dependent variable, we simply use um, the vote choice for a radical right party on one and all other parties at zero. There's a question that's also present in the European Social Survey. Um, we rerun all the analysis also only comparing the radical right to the mainstream left and mainstream right. So our zero category is not so, so many different party families and the re results uh, basically stay the same. And then we have a number of individual level covariates that we also include from the European Social Survey, a bunch of control variables, education, age, gender, and so on. Importantly then, how do we measure economic risk? And um, here we built on the, on the work of Philip Brem who uses occupational unemployment risk. So this is the objective number of unemployed people within your occupational category. And what Rem shows is that there is a, is a relationship between this objective measure and subjective perceptions of unemployment risk. So we, we build on this and rely on the fact that it's been demonstrated that there is a connection. Many other studies have used this by now too, to show that there is this relationship between um, an objective unemployment risk uh, and preferences and behavior. We do this as, as for, the, for the comparative political economy experts in the room, and we use this the so-called ISCO classification of occupations, um, and we use the, the one digit. So these are very broad categories. Um, I'll show you this in a second. And then based on a large labor market survey in the European Union that's called the EU Silk, we can measure these unemployment rates for these specific occupational groups. And with these ISCO codes, then we can match this unemployment risk to the data that we have from the European Social Survey and get the unemployment risk for individuals and also their partners. Um, this is just a, as, a, as a quick overview what this looks then. These are these different um, types of groups. And you see this here split up for men and women. Um, and of course, we see that people in more educated professional groups have a lower occupational unemployment risk um, than people in, for example, machine operators, more manual tasks. Mm, I'm also talk about this in a, uh, later. We rec replicate this with a more fine-grained scheme of these ISCO codes too, and find very similar results. And um, the, the trade-off here is always what perception of their own occupational groups people have, and how fine-grained you can become. So people, it's still reasonable that people compare each other to other people in this group. Um, we can then also show the distribution within households, right? So you have um, the, the unemployment risk of a respondent on the x-axis and the unemployment risk of their partner on the y-axis. And what we see is there is, of course, strong homophilia. So people um, have partners that are similar to them. Um, and this is why here this, um, the 45 degree line is, is right. This is, this is where most of our cases are. However, we do have the variation, right? We have this off the diagonal. We have the variation of different degrees um, of unemployment risk within partners. We also have a quite big sample um, that allows us then to, to, to estimate these different, uh, these different scenarios in our analyses. Um, what we then have is we, we do this for 12 West European countries. We include a number of socioeconomic controls. Uh, maybe here, uh, what's important is that we also control for unemployment status and partners' unemployment status. And similar to other studies, we do not find any significant effect of being unemployed or having an unemployed partner uh, on voting for the radical right. Uh, then, uh, just very briefly on, on, on the method, this is a quite straightforward logistic regression, and we include country and way fixed effect, country fixed effects um, to take things out, like, for example, the electoral system. So all these confounders 
um, that are time constant and very over very over con uh, uh, very over time. Um, wave fixed effect for some common shocks, and then cluster or standard errors. So I'm going to show you now a number of uh, results that all function in a very similar way, where always you have the predicted probability of someone voting for a radical right party on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, you have unemployment risk. And here now, this is the first uh, finding for an individual's own unemployment risk. What you see is that with unemployment risk, we find a quite strong increase of the predicted probability uh, of voting for the radical right. What's important that, of course, in our sample, um, the, the radical right doesn't take up a huge share, right? So that the baseline probability of voting for the radical right is, I think, around point, uh, 0 0.09, so about 9%. And so seeing an increase that goes up to 20% um, actually is a strong increase for, for, for this low uh, baseline probability. So this is quite a quite... Uh, substantial effect of it, an individual's own unemployment risk. Now we look at the partner's risk. And again, this is important. This is controlling, holding an own individual's risk constant, right? So controlling for your own risk, how does your partner's risk affect your probability of voting for the radical right? And again, here we find a positive significant effect. So when your partner is at a higher risk of um, becoming unemployed, you're also more likely to vote for a radical right party. Now, if we use these two in interaction, so how do these two um, work together in uh, voting for the radical right? Again, now this is very similar to these stylized uh, examples that we have, but this is based on empirical data. So again, on the x-axis, you have unemployment risk. On the y-axis, you have the predicted probability of voting for a radical right party. And then we have two scenarios. One where your partner is at high risk. This is the black line and one where um, your partner is at low risk, that's a blue, right, blue line. And what we have here is um, a relationship that speaks much more for a dominance mechanism. This looks much more like a dominance mechanism. Why? First of all, if you look at the blue line, we still see the strong increase in voting for a radical right party um, for your own, with your own unemployment risk increasing. And this is, even though your partner is at uh, low risk. The second thing is that if you are at uh, a low risk and your partner is a high risk, right? So this is the, on the left side uh, with the, for the black line, we see a strong increase in um, a nearly doubling increase or more than doubling increase in the predicted probability of voting for the radical right. So even though you are at low risk, when your partner is at high risk of becoming unemployed, you are much more likely to vote for the radical right. And then finally, we also see this difference um, between the two lines de uh, decreasing with your own unemployment risk. So there's, a, the, there's more a saturation effect, which is really the, the opposite of what we should see if there was risk pooling going on. Then we should see those uh, differences becoming stronger because with, uh, with two people with higher uh, unemployment risk, um, you should have a much stronger, uh, stronger effect. So this looks right. So there's a this is a strong indication um, that especially averaging is not what's going on. There's no safety net in this, and this is really one person um, with uh, with high risk in the household is kind of enough to trigger this mechanism. Um, we we're now also then um, splitting it up by um, by gender, where um, I haven't talked much about this because we. Um, this is of course relevant in all of these household theories, um, but we don't have specific mechanisms that we can test in this. Uh, and we just wanted to show um, that actually we don't fi we find some differences between men and women, but they're not um, incredibly pronounced. So I think what's important is that many, many people when we presented this thought this dominance mechanism should be stronger um, among women. Right, so this is the idea, this would be the, again, the, the somewhat the, the, the male breadwinner uh, as, as the focal point. We do find that, the, that, this, that this mechanism is present with women. However, um, it's similarly present. It's actually a bit stronger uh, among, among men. This is actually the clearer picture. Um, generally, we find that men more strongly respond to their own unemployment risk um, than women do. So that, there, there we find this different. Own unemployment risk is a strong, more a stronger driver of voting for the radical right for men than it is for women. Okay, we do a couple of robustness 
uh, checks. This is more for the for the uh, stats interested people uh, in the room. We also run this with a uh, with a linear probability model instead of the logistic regression, um, and also just a, a standard multi-level model with uh, random effects for country and uh, country wave instead of using the fixed effect because there are some issues with uh, the fixed effects and the uh, and the logistic regression potentially. We then also replicate this using the two-digit ISCO. I mentioned this before. So with a more fine-grained occupational measure, the problem is the more fine-grained you become, the more empty cells you have. And, um, and ISCO two-digit is really the, 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 the fine, more, most fine-grained we can do. The three-digit um, becomes too messy, but we can replicate the, the same findings um, with this two-digit. We then, um, so I didn't, con we didn't include any controls for attitudes in our original analysis because then we would argue there's a typical situation of post-treatment bias where we have these structural variables they could potentially affect attitudes and through these attitudes um, you have a mediating mechanism um, that, that could then um, also bias the main findings. We still do this, uh, this robustness check where we include typical predictors of voting for the radical right. So general left-right self-placement, attitudes for redistribution, and of course also attitudes toward immigration. And all of these have a strong effect on, uh, on voting for the radical right. What's interesting is that our main um, findings still remain significant. So unemployment risk and partners unemployment risk remain significant uh, despite controlling for these attitudinal variables. This is not a proper mediation analysis, and we're very careful with these interpretations. We think um, this, be, in, in, in combination with the constellations that we find, we think this speaks more for a protest mechanism. So the idea here is that people do not necessarily um, change their, um, their attitudes on these policy variables um, and then seek this remedy through voting for the radical right. But, and this is, as I said, this is tentative, and um, but what we think all these findings most speak for is a story where one person in the household is at economic risk, and this triggers this type of protest mechanism, this triggers a nostalgia for, for a better time, and this is then what leads to, to voting for the radical right. Finally, one thing we do, and I haven't said much about, um, about causality yet, of course, um, with the type of observational design that we have, it is difficult to make um, solid causal claims. One specific particular issue is, of course, selecting into households. Right? The, the, the problem could be that people who are similar in terms of um, the economic group, socioeconomic group they belong to, they're more likely to find each other in a household. And then you have two people who come together and um, who also might, uh, might just both support the radical right. So one thing we do here in this analysis, uh, we additionally include uh, class group fixed effects. And we measure uh, these uh, class groups um, based on a class scheme that has been, um, that, uh, the, uh, that Daniel Oesch came up with. And this is a, this is a, a class scheme um, that is very suited for post-industrial societies. So there, again, this is a, a class scheme that's based on occupational groups. And these ISCO codes are nested within these class groups. So you have something like sociocultural professionals, production workers, um, these kinds of groups. And when we, when we include these types of class group, we basically reduce all variation that we use to estimate our effects to over time variation. So it is within this class group, the changing unemployment risk over time that's then driving our findings. And again, we can, we can more or less replicate our, our findings. And we think this speaks for a, a causal relationship that we're against this type of uh, selection mechanism because it's reasonable that people select into a relationship based on these class groups, right? You, you look for a partner that's similar in terms of their, their, their class. However, we don't think that people select into, uh, in, into partnerships just based on these variation in unemployment risk, right? You don't. I mean, I don't know. I, I think I wouldn't uh, pick a partner based on, the, on an idea of, oh, uh, their unemployment risk is one point higher or lower, right? So that, there we think we take something away um, from this potential, uh, from their, this potential selection mechanism. And again, for all of these, uh, we find the same pattern of your own and your partner's unemployment risk affected, 
affecting voting for the radical right. Okay, to sum up, um, we find that uh, economic risk increases support for the radical right and is substantially moderated by household risk constellation. And we find evidence that much more speaks for this dominance mechanism than for a type of resource pooling where one member of a household can provide a safety net. So we have this tentative uh, proposition from this paper that is one high risk person per household makes two radical right voters. We of course don't know how the partners voted because we don't have that in the, in the data, but um, this is I think um, something that our, uh, that our findings speak for. And this also for research on the radical right, this means that uh, ignoring the household constellation potentially underestimates the impact of economic risks um, because we are ignoring, um, or, or we, we might underestimate this because we are not taking into account um, the effect that these partners have if we only look at the individuals. Okay, that's it uh, for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Rick. This is super interesting. Um, if anybody has any questions, please, if you could put them in the Q&A box, um, we'll be more than happy to entertain them. We have uh, half an hour left. And I guess, um, no, there's the first one right there. Um, Mihal Bolchinsky. Um, how do you deal with the fact that women report much more centrist, right, or no views at all? Um, I'm not sure if you can see in the box, but basically, uh, so this is basically translated into underreporting of radical right votes for women if women systematically report themselves as being more centrist or not having views? Mm -hmm. uh, let me think about for a second, how this, how this would affect our, our findings. So I think, right, so it, it, it is, this is certainly interesting also for the general relationship that, that's much discussed under this label of gender gap in, in radical right voting, where we find that women um, are less likely to vote for the radical right. Um, and I think that the studies who investigate this also try to rule out this more social desirability mechanism. Because we find a similar type of effect among men and women, I don't know if that gender difference is really, is, is, is really a problem for the general, uh, for the general story that we, we, we want to tell. So right, if we, if we just subset our, uh, our uh, sample to men, then we, we also find the same relationship. What's maybe interesting is that we actually, like in our data then, we see that the gender gap is for people at higher risk, right? So in a, in a way we have this, this other explanation for the, for the gender gap that this really comes from people at economic risk where then men seem to be much more likely to vote for the radical right than women. Yeah, so I, I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to ask us um, a similar question. I would put the symmetry um, or asymmetry between men and women within a household, mm -hmm. because you said that men are much more likely to respond to their own risk um, of unemployment, which is consistent mm -hmm. with this idea of sort of, you know, pro uh, might, well, it's consistent, but it's not confirmative of the protest voting idea. But what about women? Are they more likely to respond to a man's risk of unemployment or to their own? Um, so generally what we find for women is that they're just less likely to respond to unemployment risk. Right, so generally, the, the, our confidence intervals are, are larger. Um, there, I think there are lots of these, these interesting dynamics in the household playing out that we don't specifically investigate because we, our idea was, okay, let's do a first thing where we just show that this effect is present. And then there are many mechanisms that could be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing that, that you could have is this, right, this idea uh, that, that um, a man sees himself as the provider for the household. And that this is kind of this, this socialized thinking of, I need to be this person who provides. So if the, if the risk increases of becoming unemployed, then this has a stronger effect again in this backlash mechanism um, and in this protest idea. So this is something um, that could be interesting. I think another thing to look at, which we don't do in this paper is also differences of income within the household, for example, that could speak for similar mechanism um, that, that men, when, when they're in a household, of course, this all reduced to, right, um, non-same-sex households, uh, right? When, when men uh, earn less than, um, uh, than their female spouses, then this might trigger this kind of, of, of backlash uh, response to. I guess, you know, if, if, if the backlash mechanism held, then women being more likely to respond to their male partner's unemployment risk would be consistent with that, right? So then both That's men true. and women would be more likely to vote for the right 
if the man is, is at, at a higher unemployment risk. That's yeah. the only sort of you know, configuration that's consistent with this kind of you know, retrie retrieving a golden past uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that might be, it's, it's just the fact that women aren't doing that seems to undermine that a little bit. Okay. But they, I mean, they do it. So the partner's risk always has an effect. Right. Well, also, for women, right. there is an effect of the of the partner's risk. Right. But the, but the, the partner risk for women, it, it seems like you know the the overall risk results for women are just much more diffuse than for men. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So teasing out would be fun. Okay. Our next question: Do you see any variation in effect between countries? Does this indicate that different radical right parties are more or less effective at amplifying unemployment groups? Mm -hmm. um, so we've looked at this. Um, it it. Uh, so we have some quite some reduction then in in in, uh, in the in the end that we have. So our standard errors become bigger. Generally, um, our the pattern holds more or less for for all the countries that we look at. There is one exception where we find a difference because this is a country that we wanted to to study explicitly, where we were a bit um, surprised and to see really a different pattern, and that is Switzerland. So why were we so interested in Switzerland? Not only because we're based in Switzerland, but because Switzerland has a great household panel study. So where you track, where we, where, where we track people over 20 years, and that would of course be great data um, to study the, our question within um, a long running panel and over time, and then you can really see how unemployment risk is changing within, uh, within existing couples and to, to see if we find these, uh, these effects. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, these panels only exist basically in three European countries, these long-running long ones in the UK, Germany, and Switzerland. Um, in Germany, you only have voting data for the last two waves of this socioeconomic panel that's run over 35 years. It's just that they're not very interested in politics, the people who run this, uh, this panel, unfortunately. And um, in the British Household Study, you have the problem uh, that, you, that you only have UKIP as a radical right challenger. Um, that is a, a very small and that so just doesn't really help. Why do we think Switzerland might be different? The first thing is unemployment risk is generally very low, right? And even in, in, in these other groups that we look at where right, manual workers, service workers that are right, that have just higher risks um, in Switzerland, this unemployment risk is quite low. The second thing is, and again, this speaks a bit more for this protest idea, um, the radical right party in Switzerland, the Swiss People's Party is of course a very established radical right party. Um, they've been in government for uh, a really long time. Uh, they're the, by far the largest party uh, in terms of vote share. So you have this um, established party and this party might trigger less of this type of protest voting um, than other parties do. So there we really don't find this, uh, this type of interaction. In other countries, we see a similar pattern. I still think it would be interesting to try to um, investigate country differences. For example, is this, um, does the welfare state provide a remedy for this mechanism? Is if there's generous unemployment benefits, um, do they help to, uh, do they reduce this relationship between risk and, and, and radical right voting? Um, but we don't specifically study them and don't necessarily find strong country differences. Right. Um, we have another question from Denise Ivanov about uh, the supply side and he acknowledged that this is a demand side analysis, but what is the sort of you know, response of radical right parties and do they sort of target voters who are at a high unemployment uh, risk mm -hmm. or amplify um, perception? I, I, that's a very good question. Uh, I think it's important that finding a, um, an, econom an economics driven effect at the demand side does not necessarily mean this is all about economics or economic policies, right? So the, the, this, I think as we try to argue, this is, on the one hand, I think this has a lot to do actually with the populism of radical right parties. Um, and and, and we, we have a, so, so Thomas actually and, and, and I work together in a, in, in a larger project um, that tries to investigate um, how state perceptions of status and so status threat are related to voting behavior and especially to, to voting for the radical right too. And my basic idea is there that people who um, think they're at the lower end of this uh, social hierarchy and also especially think um, that society is moving away from them. So it's not going to get better if anything is going to get worse. So they, they, they see themselves stuck in this, in, in this losing position. What they want is a change of the rules of the game. 
they're not satisfied with just a policy position change. They don't want more or less social protection or something. They really want to, they, they, wanna, they want an overhaul of where this society is going. And I'm not going to say they want to make America great again, but this is the idea, right? They, they want a, a fundamental change um, of, of what's going on. And this is why they, this populist idea is so appealing to them. I think this populist idea, but also this authoritarian nostalgia that the radical right is, is offering. Of course, welfare chauvinism also perfectly well fits the story, but again, this would be more this policy mechanism, right? This is kind of a voting for the radical right then is a rational response if you wanna, if you wanna use that terminology. So it's you're at risk and they're providing a solution for your risk. They say, okay, there's, right? Um, those immigrants are taking your jobs away. So let's good, get rid of the immigrants and you'll be less at risk. This is kind of, this is a policy mechanism uh, for this type of voting behavior. Um, this, at least what we are studying is really a bit more this, uh, the populist anti-elite, anti-establishment plus authoritarian um, backlash uh, uh, argument there, but we, we can tease them out in this paper. Just as, as an intervention, it might make sense to then look at countries code basically support for parties that have entered government in the past or are in government versus those who are purely protest, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because you should, see, you should see exactly that pattern um, that you're describing. You can just very nicely distinguish between the two. Yeah, um, there's, there's, a oh, paper, yeah there's a paper by Dennis Cohen, uh, who's also a co-author, so I should promote this now. I think he shows that when radical right parties have in government before, or even when they've become more established in parliament, then anti-establishment attitudes play a smaller role for uh, voting for them. Yeah, they become more credible policymakers, right? Yeah. Um, Christoph has two great questions. One is about um, applying your conclusions to same-sex households. And the other one mm -hmm. is apply about applying the analysis to the US elections. You knew you were going to get that question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, let me start with the same-sex household. Uh, that's a, I think this is an interesting question. The, um, so the data in the European Social Survey doesn't really out. It's just too few cases to um, study, to, to, to specifically study this. The Stuart Turnbull Dugarte has a couple of interesting papers on um, voting among um, people who live in same sex households. Uh, and, 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 and I think this studies this generally, uh, radical, right part, uh, radical right voting, is, you see less among um, members of the, of the LGBT population. Um, we are actually working on the moment in se several projects where we want to where, where we want to study this population um, a little more, uh, and so we are fielding a survey at the moment in Switzerland where we will have this two uh, two wave panel, um, and we'll oversample um, gays and lesbians. So we'll we'll have a, a sample and, we'll, uh, and a panel. Why are we doing this here at the moment? Because Swiss Parliament is going to pass same sex marriage pretty soon. West, one of the few countries to the left in Europe, or Western Europe at least, uh, who don't have same-sex marriage. And there's very likely going to be a referendum against this. So some of the more Christian parties have already um, announced that they'll hold a referendum. And so we'll want to study uh, the, the straight population and the gay and lesbian population before and after this referendum, and then actually look at a couple of things. So for the straight population, it, it, exactly, again, this nostalgia effect, and can we trigger the sentiment of, um, of backlash by reminding people of the voting results and again, society moving moving away from them. And this is somehow studying uh, triggering status threat. And then on the other hand, we, um, we, we have this for the, um, we have a couple of things that we can look at for uh, gays and lesbians. So I haven't really thought about the differences for in terms of um, unemployment risk and these household mechanisms, I think um, patterns of homonationalism and potential support for the radical right among um, gays and lesbians is a very interesting question. So one question we will have in this project is basically a ve very simplified. Once uh, same-sex marriage as a, let's say, bourgeois uh, LGBT policy is, uh, is, is introduced and passed, will um, some uh, gays and lesbians become more likely uh, to then uh, turn to a radical right out of this, uh, this idea that they're now more in tune with the nation they, uh, they belong to. So this would be one thing that, that we, we look at. Okay, this was a um, long response for basically saying we don't have any, we don't have any data on this uh, in, in, in this paper. 
The US election. Um, yes, I think it's, I think this is certainly in line with many of the findings that show um, the people who are who support Trump are not necessarily the economically marginalized, right? They're not the, the economically left behind. But it is a type of lower middle class petty bourgeoisie uh, that has shifted also from the Democrats to Trump, who thinks there, there's a threat that they're losing something. And again, right, this is, this is how we see this unemployment risk. It's, it's, it's not purely as an economic trigger, but as this, as this idea that, yeah, you want, um, you want to stop society, or it's, it, it triggers um, this, this mechanism where you think uh, society is moving uh, into a wrong direction. Um, Thomas, my, my co-author, actually, his dissertation, in his dissertation, he looks at how um, people whose job is threatened by automation, how this affects their voting behavior. And what, is fine, what he finds is that the people who support the radical right are not the ones who lose their job due to automation, but it's the ones who stay in their job, but they're, they're, they are at, at this latent risk of losing their job. And again, I think this is something that, that, that very well fits at least one type of um, of Trump supporter. I also try to emphasize that right, the Trump vote is not a working class vote, right? If anything, it's a white working class vote. It's much more a white vote, right? This is a white vote, it's a Republican idea and, and so on. So this one group that, especially when you look from Europe, there's this strong focus on this uh, Rust Belt voters, right? The old um, routine workers, they now support Trump. And this is, of course, just a tiny part of the story. It, it's one that matters at the margins, that, right? This is especially in these uh, in these three states uh, that uh, that Clinton lost that cost her the election. This this, this mattered, but it's a, it's really an, an, an incomplete explanation of um, also radical right support in the U.S. Well. If there are no other questions, then I, Derek, I wanted to thank you very much for a fantastic presentation and a really interesting project, um, one that could not be more timely. Um, you know, however, we might, we might feel about its timeliness. <laughs> but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And to all of you who participated, thank you for coming and sharing in this research. Thanks very thank much. You. Yeah, thanks.